Section 49 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 49. Selections from Constantinople and Spain by Edmundo de Amicis. Edmundo de Amicis, 1846. 1908. In 1869, Vita Militari, Military Life, a collection of short stories, was perhaps the most popular Italian volume of the year. Read alike in Court and Cottage, it was everywhere discussed and enthusiastically praised. Its prime quality was that quivering sympathy which ensures some success to any imaginative work, however crudely written. But these sketches of all the grim and amusing phases of Italian soldier life are drawn with an exquisite precision. The reader feels the breathless discouragement of the tired soldiers when new dusty vistas are revealed by a sudden turn in the road, a midsummer march, understands the strong silent love between officer and orderly suppressed by military etiquette, the orderly, smiles with the soldiers at the pretty runaway boy, idol of the regiment, the son of the regiment, pities the humiliations of the conscript novice, the conscript, thrills with the proud sorrow of the old man whose son's colonel tells the story of his heroic death, dead on the field of battle. When I had finished reading it, said an Italian workman, I would gladly have pressed the hand of the first soldier whom I happened to meet. The author was only twenty-three, and has since given the world many delightful volumes, but nothing finer. These sketches were founded upon personal knowledge, for the Amicis began life as a soldier. After his early education at Coney and Turin, he entered the military school at Modena, from which he was sent out as sub-lieutenant in the 3rd Regiment of the Line. He saw active service in various expeditions against Sicilian brigands, and in the war with Austria he fought at the Battle of Custoza. His literary power seems to have been early manifest, for in 1867 he became manager of a newspaper, L'Italia Militari, at Florence, and in 1871, yielding to his friends' persuasions, he settled down to authorship at Turin. His second book was the Ricordi, memorials dedicated to the youth of Italy of national events which had come within his experience. Half a dozen later stories published together were also very popular, especially Giamici di Collegio, College Friends, Fortezza, and La Casa Paterna, The Paternal Home. He has written some graceful verse as well. But the Amicis soon craved the stimulus of novel environments of different personalities, and he set out upon the troubles which he has so delightfully recounted. This ardent Italian longed for the repose of a gray sky, a critic tells us. He went first to Holland and experienced a joyous satisfaction in the careful art of that trim little land. Later, a visit to North Africa in the suite of the Italian ambassador prompted a brilliant volume, Morocco, which glitters and flashes like a Damascus blade. Among his other well-known books descriptive of other trips are Holland and its people, Spain, London, Paris, and Constantinople, which translated into many languages have been widely read. That unfortunate though not uncommon traveler who finds ennui everywhere must abide the amicis his inexhaustible enthusiasm, his power of epicurean judgment, and the color and glory of every land. His is a curiously optimistic nature. Always perceiving the beautiful and picturesque in art and nature, he treats other aspects hopefully and ignores them when he may. He catches what is characteristic in every nation as inevitably as he catches the physiognomy of the land with its skies and its waters, its flowers and its atmosphere. He is a realism transfigured by poetic imagination, which divines essential things and places them in high relief. Very early in life, the Amicis announced his love and admiration of Manzoni, of whom he called himself a disciple. But his is a very different mind. This Italian, born at Onigia of Genoese parents, has inherited the emotional nature of his country. He sees everything with feeling, penetrating below the surface with sympathetic insight. Italy gives him his sensuous zest in life. But from France, through his love of her vigor and grace, his cordial admiration of her literature, he has gained a refining and strengthening influence. She has taught him that direct diction, that choice simplicity, which forsakes the stilted Italian of literary tradition for a style far simpler, stronger, and more natural. The Light, from Constantinople. And first of all, the light. One of my dearest delights at Constantinople was to see the sun rise and set, standing upon the bridge of the Sultana Balide. At dawn, in autumn, the golden horn is almost always covered by a light fog behind which the city is seen vaguely, like those gay curtains that descend upon the stage to conceal the preparations for a scenic spectacle. Scutari is quite hidden. Nothing is to be seen but the dark uncertain outline of her hills. The bridge and the shores are deserted. Constantinople sleeps. 
the solitude and silence render the spectacle more solemn the sky begins to grow golden behind the hills of scutari upon that luminous strip are drawn one by one black and clear the tops of the cypress trees in the vast cemetery like an army of giants ranged upon the heights and from one cape of the golden horn to the other there shines a tremulous light faint as the first murmur of the awakening city then behind the cypresses of the asiatic shore comes forth an eye of fire and suddenly the white tops of the four minarets of saint sophia are tinted with deep rose in a few minutes from hill to hill from mosque to mosque down to the end of the golden horn all the minarets one after the other turn rose color all the domes one by one are silvered the flush descends from terrace to terrace the tremulous light spreads the great bile melts and all stamboul appears rosy and resplendent upon her heights blue and violet along the shores fresh and young as if just rising from the waters as the sun rises the delicacy of the first tints vanishes in an immense illumination and everything remains bathed in white light until toward evening then the divine spectacle begins again the air is so limpid that from galara one can see clearly every distant tree as far as cadi kioi the whole of the immense profile of istanbul stands out against the sky with such a clearness of line and rigor of color that every minaret obelisk and cypress tree can be counted one by one from seraja point to the cemetery of eov the golden horn and the bosphorus assume a wonderful ultramarine color the heavens the color of amethyst in the east are afire behind istanbul tinting the horizon with infinite lights of rose and carbuncle that make one think of the first day of the creation istanbul darkens the galata becomes golden and scutari struck by the last rays of the setting sun with every pane of glass giving black the glow looks like a city on fire and this is the moment to contemplate constantinople there is one rapid succession of the softest pines pallid gold rose and lilac which quiver and float over the sides of the hills and the water every moment giving and taking away the price of beauty from each part of the city and revealing a thousand modest graces of the landscape that have not dared to show themselves in the full light great melancholy suburbs are lost in the shadow of the valleys little purple cities smile upon the heights villages faint as if about to die others die at once like extinguished flames others that seem already dead revive and glow and quiver yet a moment longer under the last ray of the sun then there is nothing left but two resplendent points upon the asiatic shore the summit of mount bulgurlu and the extremity of the cape that guards the entrance to the propontis they are at first two golden crowns then two purple caps then two rubies then all constantinople is in shadow and ten thousand voices from ten thousand minarets announce the close of the day resemblances from constantinople in the first days fresh as i was from the perusal of oriental literature i saw everywhere the famous personages of history and legend and the figures that recalled then resembled sometimes so faithfully those that were fixed in my imagination that i was constrained to stop and look at them how many times have i seized my friend by the arm and pointing to a person passing by have exclaimed is it he cospero do you not recognize him in the square of the sultana balide i frequently saw the gigantic turk who threw down millstones from the walls of nikaea on the heads of the soldiers of bagjan i saw in front of a mosque um Jamil, that old fury that sowed brambles and nettles before mohammed's house i met in the book bazaar with a volume under his arm jamaladin the learned man of brusa who knew the whole of the arab dictionary by heart i passed quite close to the side of ayesha the favorite wife of the prophet and she fixed upon my face her eyes brilliant and humid like the reflection of stars in a well i have recognized in the at maidan the famous beauty of that poor greek woman killed by a cannonball at the base of the serpentine column i have been face to face in the fanar with kara abderrahman the handsome young turk of the time of orkhan i have seen kaswa the she camel of the prophet i have encountered kara bulut selim's black steed i have met the poor poet fignahi condemned to go about istanbul tied to an ass for having pierced with an insolent distich the grand vizier of ibrahim i have been in the same cafe with soliman the big the monstrous admiral whom four robust slaves hardly succeeded in lifting from the divan ali the grand vizier who could not find in all arabia a horse that could carry him mahmoud pasha the ferocious hercules that strangled the son of soliman and the stupid ahmed sakon who continually replied coso coso very well very well crouching before the dog of the copists bazaar in the square of bajazet all the personages of the thousand and one knights the aladdins the Zubaydis, the simbads the gulnaris the old jewish merchants possessors of enchanted carpets and wonderful lamps passed before me like a procession of phantoms birds from constantinople 
constantinople has one grace and gaiety peculiar to itself that comes from an infinite number of birds of every kind for which the turks nourish a warm sentiment and regard mosques grubs old walls gardens palaces all resound with song the whistling and twittering of birds everywhere wings are fluttering and life and harmony abound the sparrows enter the houses bodily and eat out of women's and children's hands swallows nest over the cafe doors and under the arches of the bazaars pigeons in innumerable swarms maintained by legacies from sultans and private individuals from garlands of black and white along the cornices of the cupolas and around the terraces of the minarets seagulls dart and play over the water thousands of turtle doves coo amorously among the cypresses in the cemeteries crowds crook about the castle of the seven towers halcyons come and go in long files between the black sea and the sea of marmora and storks sit upon the cupolas of the mausoleums for the turk each one of these birds has a gentle meaning or a benignant virtue turtle doves are favorable to lovers swallows keep away fire from the roofs where they build their nests the storks make yearly pilgrimages to mecca halcyons carry the souls of the faithful to paradise those he protects and feeds them through a sentiment of gratitude and piety and they enliven the house the sea and the sepulchre every quarter of stamboul is full of the noise of them bringing to the city a sense of the pleasures of country life and continually refreshing the soul with a reminder of nature cordoba from spain for a long distance the country offers no new aspect to the feverish curiosity of the tourist at Vilches there is a vast plain, and beyond there the open country of Tolosa, where Alfonso the Eighth, King of Castile, gained the celebrated victory, de las Navas, over the Mussulman army. The sky was very clear, and in the distance one could see the mountains of the Sierra de Segura. Suddenly there comes over one a sensation which seems to respond to a suppressed exclamation of surprise. The first alloys, with their thick leaves, the unexpected heralds of tropical vegetation, rise on both sides of the road. Beyond, the fields studded with flowers begin to appear. The first are studded, those which follow almost covered, then come vast stretches of ground entirely clothed with poppies, daisies, lilies, wild mushrooms, and ranunculuses, so that the country, as it presents itself to view, looks like a succession of immense purple, gold, and snowy-hued carpets. In the distance, among the trees, are innumerable blue, white, and yellow streaks as far as the eye can reach, and nearer, on the banks of the ditches, the elevations of ground, the slopes, and even on the edge of the road, are flowers in beds, clumps, and clusters, one above the other, grouped in the form of great bouquet, and trembling on their stalks, which one can almost touch with his hand. Then there are fields white with great blades of grain, flanked by plantations of roses, orange groves, immense olive groves, and hillsides varied by a thousand shades of green, surmounted by ancient Moorish towers, and scattered with many colored houses, and between the one and the other are white and slender bridges that cross rivulets hidden by the trees. On the horizon appear the snowy caps of the Sierra Nevada, under that white streak lie the undulating blue ones of the nearer mountains the country becomes more varied and flourishing arjonilla lies in a grove of olives whose boundary one cannot see pedro abad in the midst of a plain covered with vineyards and fruit trees ventas de alcolea on the last hills of the sierra nevada people with villas and gardens we are approaching cordoba the train flies along we see little stations half hidden by trees and flowers the wind carries the rose leaves into the carriages great butterflies fly near the windows a delicious perfume permeates the air the travellers sing we pass through an enchanted garden the aloes oranges palms and villas grow more frequent and at last we hear a cry here is cordoba how many lovely pictures and grand recollections the sound of that name awakens in one's mind cordoba the ancient pearl of the east as the arabian poet calls it the city of cities cordoba of the thirty suburbs and three thousand mosques which enclosed within her walls the greatest temple of islam her fame extended throughout the east and obscured the glory of ancient damascus the faithful came from the most remote regions of asia to banks of the Guadalquivir to prostrate themselves in the marvelous mirab of her mosque in the light of the thousand bronze lamps cast from the bells of the cathedrals of spain hither flocked artists sabbats poets from every part of the mahomedan world to her flourished schools immense libraries and the magnificent courts of her caliphs riches and beauty flowed in attracted by the fame of her splendor from here they scattered eager for knowledge along the coasts of africa through the schools of tunis cairo baghdad cufa and even to india and china in order to gather inspiration and records and the poetry song on the slopes of the sierra morena flew from lyre to lyre as far as the valleys of the caucasus to excite the ardor of pilgrimages the beautiful powerful and wise cordoba crowned with three thousand villages proudly raises her white minarets in the midst of orange groves and spread around the valley a voluptuous atmosphere of joy and glory i leave the train cross the garden look around me i am alone the travellers who were with me disappear here and there 
I still hear the noise of a carriage which is rolling off. Then all is quiet. It is midday, the sky is very clear, and the air is suffocating. I see two white houses. It is the opening of a street. I enter and go on. The street is narrow. The houses are small as little villas on the slopes of artificial gardens, almost all one story in height, with windows a few feet from the ground, the roof so low that one could almost touch them with a stick, and the walls very white. The street turns. I look, see no one, and hear neither step nor voice. I say to myself, this must be an abandoned street, and try another one, in which the houses are white, the windows closed, and there is nothing but silence and solitude around me. Why? Where am I? I ask myself. I go on. The street, which is so narrow that a carriage could not pass, begins to wind. On the right and left I see other deserted streets, white houses and closed windows. My step resounds as if in a corridor. The whiteness of the walls is so vivid that even the reflection is trying, and I am obliged to walk with my eyes half closed, for it really seems as if I were making my way through the snow. I reach a small square, everything is closed, and no one is to be seen. At this point a vague feeling of melancholy seizes me, such as I have never experienced before. A mixture of pleasure and sadness, similar to that which comes to children when, after a long run, they reach a lonely rural spot and rejoice in their discovery, but with a certain trepidation lest they should be too far from home. Above many roofs rise the palm trees of inner gardens. Oh, fantastic legends of what Alice can caliph. On I go from street to street, and square to square. I begin to meet some people, but they pass and disappear like phantoms. All these streets resemble each other. The houses have only three or four windows, and not a spot, scrawl, or crack is to be seen on the walls, which are as smooth and white as a sheet of paper. From time to time I hear a whisper behind a blind, and see, almost at the same moment, a dark head, with a flower in the hair, appear and disappear. I look in at the door. A patio. How shall I describe a patio? It is not a court, not a garden, not a room, but it is all three things combined. Between the patio and the street there is a vestibule. On the four sides of the patio rise slender columns, which support up to a level with the first floor a species of gallery enclosed in glass. Above the gallery is a stretch of canvas, which shades the court. The vestibule is paved with marble, the door flanked by columns surmounted by bas reliefs and closed by a slender iron gate of graceful design. At the end of the patio there is a fountain, and all around are scattered chairs, work tables, pictures, and vases of flowers. I run to another door. There is another patio, with its walls covered with ivy and a number of niches holding little statues, busts, and urns. I look in at the third door. Here is another patio, with its walls worked in mosaics, a palm in the center, and a mass of flowers all around. I stop at the fourth door. After the patio there is another vestibule. After this a second patio, in which one sees other statues, columns, and fountains. All these rooms and gardens are so neat and clean that one could pass his hand over the walls and on the ground without leaving a trace and they are fresh, odorous, and lighted by an uncertain light, which increases their beauty and mysterious appearance. On I go at random from street to street. As I walk, my curiosity increases, and I quicken my pace. It seems impossible that a whole city can be like this. I am afraid of stumbling across some house or coming into some street that will remind me of other cities and disturb my beautiful dream. But no, the dream lasts, for everything is small, lovely, and mysterious. At every hundred steps I reach a deserted square, in which I stop and hold my breath. From time to time, there appears a crossroad, and not a living soul is to be seen. Everything is white, the windows closed, and silence reigns on all sides. At each door there is a new spectacle. There are arches, columns, flowers, jets of water, and palms. A marvelous variety of design, tents, light, and perfume. Here the odor of roses, there of oranges, farther on of pinks and with this perfume a whiff of fresh air, and with the air a subdued sound of women's voices, the rustling of leaves, and the singing of birds. It is a sweet and varied harmony, that without disturbing the silence of the streets, soothes the ear like the echo of distant music. Ah, it is not a dream. Madrid, Italy, Europe are indeed far away. Here one lives another life, and breathes the air of a different world. For I am in the East. End of section 49